Today I'm going to talk about Durkheim's ideas on the division of labor, his work, The Division of Labor. The question that Durkheim is trying to answer in this piece, his concern, is that of the Hobbesian question. And this was a question posed by the philosopher Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century. And what Hobbes wanted to know was, how is it possible for people to live together without constantly being at each other's throats? How do we avoid a war against all? And Hobbes' answer is provided in his book, Leviathan. And the answer was, he said that we enter into a social contract. People give up many of their freedoms to a powerful state so that that state will in turn protect them from each other. So Durkheim wasn't satisfied with that answer, and he wasn't satisfied with the answers provided by utilitarianism, which was a famous philosophy of the 19th century. Um, some of the utilitarians were John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. And they argued that humans are self-interested creatures who attempt to maximize our rewards and minimize our costs. So society for the utilitarians was nothing but an aggregate of individuals pursuing their own self-interests. Why is the utilitarian answer problematic? Well, we'd have to think about what keeps society together? What keeps us all from destroying each other? How can we explain altruism under those kinds of ideas? People don't always act rationally. And rationality can be socially constructed. And one of the examples I sometimes use in class is the question of, is it rational to fall in love? Right? So some, some people, if rationality is socially constructed for some it is rational to fall in love because you enter into a partnership and you get things from that partnership. Um, you know, you, you, you share, you share workload, you get emotional support. But for others, they may say it's completely irrational to fall in love, that love's a, a kind of irrational state of being. You might, when you enter into these partnerships, these relationships, you might get less out of the relationship than your partner does. So it might be uneven. Um, falling in love is very distracting. It's a distraction from work, from your productivity. You might not spend as much time with your other family members. S social obligations and love can make you do crazy things. So rash this idea that we, this utilitarian perspective and its focus on rationality, that's one of the critiques is rationality socially constructed and that people don't always act um, rationally depending on how you define it and that there are also acts of altruism. Durkheim argued that no social order in which people pursued their own self-interest could be stable. Society for Durkheim had to be a force above and beyond individuals, a force that restricted their actions in certain ways. And so in your textbook, Durkheim states, above all, we must determine the degree to which the solidarity it, meaning society, produces, contributes generally to the integration of society. Only then shall we learn to what extent it is necessary, whether it is an essential factor in social cohesion or whether, on the contrary, it is only an ancillary and secondary condition for it. To answer this question, we must therefore compare the social bond to others in order to measure what share in the total effect must be attributed to it. To do this, it is indispensable to begin by classifying the different species of solidarity. So in other words, his answer is the division of labor, where he states, as we advance in the evolutionary scale, the ties which bind the individual to his family, to his native soil, to traditions which the past has given him, to collective group usages, become loose. More mobile, he changes his environment more easily, leaves his people to go elsewhere to live a more autonomous existence, to a greater extent forms his own ideas and sentiments. And we've certainly seen, have seen this in societies that move from agricultural to industrialized. People move away from their families to make a living. And this change is Durkheim's central concern. So man would no longer be sufficiently obligated. He would no longer feel about and above him this salutary pressure of society which moderates his egoism and makes him a normal being. This is what gives moral value to the division of labor. 
In short, since the division of labor becomes the chief source of social solidarity, it becomes at the same time the foundation of the moral order. So Durkheim comes to the conclusion that a stable social order could be created in two ways, mechanical and organic solidarity. So with mechanical solidarity, this kind is typified by feelings of likeness. It's rooted in everyone doing the same things, feeling the same things, and it's characteristic of small traditional society. And what causes society to go from mechanical to evolving into organic solidarity? Population density. As the population grows, social interaction becomes more intense, and this creates greater specialization. So individuals come to depend on each other so much that they have to harmonize their actions. And so if you look on page 16, 116 of your text, Durkheim states, the law we've just established is quite otherwise. We say not that the growth and condensation of societies permit, but that they necessitate a greater division of labor. So with that growing, with, it, with that population density, that change necessitates a change in the division of labor. So organic society is marked by this increased individualism and specialization. And so you can see here a comparison of mechanical and organic solidarity. And there are different kinds of laws and punishments associated with each type of society. With mechanical solidarity, punishment is punitive. Here, if someone commits a crime, the entire community engages in a form of group punishment. There's not as much concern over the conditions of why the crime was committed. So it's punitive and it's this sort of collective shaming. Sometimes I point my students if they've watched The Handmaid's Tale, right, that sort of collective punishment that you see early in that series. And with organic solidarity, it's a focus on rehabilitative punishment. With this kind of punishment, there is a concern over the conditions of the crime. We want to know why the crime was committed. We're interested here in rehabilitating the offender so that they might be integrated, reintegrated into society. Well, Durkheim's work then really influenced uh, criminology and criminology as a field within sociology as well. Durkheim's arguing here that there are functions to crime, right? He's a functionalist. Crime marks the boundaries of acceptable behavior. Crime increases social bonds. It creates social solidarity. He recognizes that what's defined as a crime in one era can change in another, but this often works to the benefit of society. And here you see his example of Socrates. And this is on page 128. He says, according to Athenian law, Socrates was a criminal and his condemnation was no more than just. However, his crime, namely the independence of his thought, rendered a service not only to humanity, but to his country. It served to prepare a new morality and faith, which the Athenians needed, since the traditions by which they had lived until then were no longer in harmony with the current conditions of life. It would never have been possible to establish the freedom of thought we now enjoy if the regulations prohibiting it had not been violated before, being solemnly abrogated. At that time, however, the violation was a crime since it was an offense against sentiments still very keen in the average conscience. And yet this crime was useful as a prelude to reforms which daily become more necessary. So there's crime is beneficial in that sense. And it evolves over time and evolves over time in a positive direction in a way that benefits society. So Durkheim's analysis of crime, like much of his work, and like we've already talked about with the overarching paradigm of functionalism, there's a dismissal here of power. What is defined as a law at any given time is largely determined by power. Who controls the decisions over laws? And who does this benefit? For example, slavery was not a crime for over 200 years. This did change, and so we could argue, well, society evolved, and society developed new laws to get rid of southern plantation slavery. 
So here I want you to take a look at that film that is in Blackboard for you called Slavery by Another Name. You can also look at 13th, but the reason why I still, 13th is that Netflix series, but I still use Slavery by Another Name because it's drawing on um, slave narratives and letters that are enacted in this film. And so you can see this um, history brought to life. So I want you to view this film and think about this, what's going on here in Slavery by Another Name with regard to Durkheim's theory. After slavery was supposed to have been abolished, the white elite did come up with new ways to re-enslave African Americans. And here we see the beginnings of the prison industrial complex. So the film discusses the power and control of a small slaveholding elite. And working class European Americans also benefited from this new system of slavery via the criminal justice system because they would work in slave patrols. Um, they would go out and pick up and arrest ex-slaves for ridiculous crimes that were newly created for the purpose of re-enslaving African Americans. So new crimes were purposely created intentionally. There was a hand at the throttle. It wasn't just something that evolved um, naturally without human decision and, and human action. So some of the new crimes, for example, it was a crime to walk beside a railroad. It was a crime for spitting, talking too loudly, lo loitering in public, selling products from your farm after dark, theft of a pig equaled five years in prison. And the film goes over some of the most damaging statutes, the vagrancy statutes. If you could not produce a document in the moment when someone's seeing you standing around showing that you are employed, then you could be imprisoned. And those arrested were sold into labor camps, chain gangs. This persisted until World War II, which is what, what the time period that Doug Blackman uses, that's where he marks the true end of slavery around 1945, and he's the author of Slavery by Another Name. And one of the points of the film is that those in the South relied on free labor for over 200 years, the slave holding elite, and it was so much a part of the economy. They weren't just going to give that up because there was this emancipation proclamation. So the white elite who still had all the power and resources to create new laws to serve their interests did so. They had more power than African Americans to see their interests were met. So it's not that society naturally evolved. Power has a lot to do with how it changes, which laws are created and who they benefit and who or what will be criminalized. So even if you don't have time to watch the entire film, at least watch about 13, from 13 minutes into about 30 minutes at least. And we'll see throughout the semester that many theories didn't account for racial power or the experiences of, of people of color and women. So Durkheim's orientation, what was his theoretical orientation? This goes back from day one in class, um, the first chapter you read that looked at the, these different dimensions and trying to think about and categorize different theories. This is a tool that your authors give you. Durkheim was mostly concerned with analyzing social facts. He sought to uncover the pre-existing social conditions that shape parameters for individual behavior. So Consequently, Durkheim can be said to be predominantly collectivist in his approach. And he's primarily non-rationalistic in his orientation because he's focusing on collective representation, moral sentiments um, as a motivating force, much more so than rational or strategic interests connected to economic and political institutions. So we can see him as more collectivist rather than individualistic and more focusing on non-rational versus rational. Well, some of the critiques of Durkheim, so again, no conceptualization of power, for example, in his discussion of crime, that reification of society that we talked about before with this paradigm, characterizing society as a super person which acts and thinks and feels. And this is problem it really is also related to the next one that there's an over socialized conception of humans Durkheim seems to believe that everything we are is completely the product of society and sure individuals are heavily shaped by the characteristics of their societies and individuals are born into ongoing societies with social facts which were pre-existing they are there before we're born and they will be there after we die but we should question how a particular set of social facts gets established in the first place. 
It's not enough to know that individuals are shaped by society. How do individuals also create society? There's also an emphasis on harmony at the expense of conflict. Durkheim seems to stress the more consensual features of society at the expense of those involving conflict and disorder. So, for example, his analysis of religion focuses on religion's role as a social integrator. But this is only part of the story. Religion is a powerful tool for integration within religious groups themselves, but it can also be extremely divisive with respect to relations between religious groups or even within. I mean, for example, is religion was in an integrated force in Northern Ireland with regard to relations between Protestants and Catholics? Is it an integrated force in Lebanon with regard to relations between Muslims and Christians? Much of what Durkheim says about religion makes good sense, but again, he's only capturing part of the story. Now, none of this means that all of what Durkheim is saying is useless. As I've pointed out before, his work continues to be very productive. It continues to produce interesting studies and informing studies and new ideas. The balance between social integration and regulation can still explain a lot. And that we looked at with regard to suicide. And we could evaluate a lot of social phenomenon using those variables that he developed. So start thinking about possibilities here for your final paper. Maybe you want to apply Durkheim. So until next time, we'll continue with Merton and other theories of functionalism.